Jane Armstrong has just told me that Elizabeth Stitt had a little baby boy this morning. Joyce, she was Stitt, and we do congratulate uh, Elizabeth and Raymond at this particular time. Let us just quieten our hearts before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the safe arrival of this little baby boy. And we pray for Joshua, that he might be a true Joshua, that he might be a man like Joshua in the Old Testament, a man of God. We pray that early in life he may come to know the Lord Jesus and that he and his little sister may grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ. We commend that family to thee. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of coming to your word this morning. And we pray that we might know the help and aid of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for these things which are most surely believed among us. And we pray, Lord, that as we come to the sacred truth this morning, that we might know the enlightenment and aid and ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. We ask it for Christ's sake. Amen. I want you to take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, we've been looking these Sunday mornings at things which are most surely believed among us. And I want to deal with you, I want to deal this morning on the subject of headship, the headship of Christ, or I want to deal with the subject, is head covering scriptural? Is it biblical? Now, if you're here in the meeting this morning and you have no head covering on, I don't want to offend you. This is not going to embarrass you. I'm going to teach what I believe 1 Corinthians 11 teaches, and it's up to you to respond to this word of the Lord. Way back in the year 1995, four elders arrived at our house in Belfast. The four elders were Gordon Wells and Walton Gracie and Gerald Hewitt and Billy Russell, and they came to discuss with me the vacancy of this church. At that time, I was in the Iron Hall Assembly in East Belfast. They had about 30 things they wanted to discuss with me. They were very wise elders. And one of the issues that they came to discuss with me was the subject of head covering. They asked me what I believed on head covering, and I told them, and then I asked them individually what they believed on head covering, and they told me... And both of the views were in harmony. I say that because I don't want you to think that this is Dennis Lyle going off on one of his tangents. It's not. All of the elders believe what I am going to set forth this morning. In fact, recently at the youth rally, our brother Morris Warburton gave a wonderful exposition of 1 Corinthians 11 that is available to you upstairs. And so I had been thinking about this subject for some time, and then a young mother in the assembly approached me and said, can we have some teaching on head covering? And so it's in response to all of that and my own exercise that I want to leave 1 Corinthians 11 with you this morning. Let's look at it together. Paul says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ." Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances. And the scholars tell me that it's the word traditions. And Paul's not dealing here with uh, ecclesiastical traditions. He's dealing with apostolic traditions. That was doctrine and instruction as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one, as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power or a sign of submission on her head because of the angels. 
And nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man and the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves, it is, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is, glo- it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Small group of Christians were discussing the subject of the head covering one day when an elder happened to join them. And when he heard that the conversation had to do with the subject of head covering, he dismissed the matter with the remark, it is insignificant. One can hardly blame many of those Christian ladies who go to an assembly of God's people without a head covering when they have not been taught by their leaders, pastors, elders, what is biblically correct. The question thus arises, is the matter insignificant or is it scriptural? Some churches teach one thing. Some some churches teach another. Some ignore the matter altogether. For some believers, the head covering is a mark of spirituality. For other Christians, it's a sign of legalism. To some people, it's a test of orthodoxy. To others, it's an empty tradition. Unfortunately, there are too many believers who decide on this question without discovering what the Bible has to say. You see, the only question that concerns us this morning is this. What saith the Scripture? Various arguments have been made to explain away and get rid of this uncomfortable teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want to look at, by way of introduction this morning, at some of those arguments. Argument number one says that Paul's teaching here is trivial. The head covering is trivial. We should not be fighting over these trivial matters. Why we should be reaching a lost world. My friends, it's not trivial to God. The word that Paul uses for ordinances in verse 2 is interesting. It's the word traditions. And Paul is speaking to us about apostolic apostolic traditions that have been preserved for us in the New Testament, and that the head covering is part of what Paul means by these apostolic traditions is indicated by verse 3. Look at it. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God he was indicating that there was another point to be made clear concerning these apostolic traditions, which were traditions that involved doctrine and practice. It's interesting that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the word traditions is used to include the doctrine of the second advent of Jesus Christ. Is that trivial? Is that irrelevant? The same word is used of the head cover. Argument number two says, Paul's teaching here is local and temporary. The head covering, or the practice of having the head covered, was for the Corinthian women alone. Corinth was a licentious city. It was a perverted sexual city. And Paul exhorted these women at Corinth to conform to a legal code of decency to wear a head covering in Corinth that would distinguish them from the prostitutes on the street. It was local custom. It was never meant to be extended to the whole church. If you drop your eye down to verse 16... Verse 16 makes that view untenable. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom or practice. Listen to it. Neither the churches of God. What's Paul saying? He's not legislating for Corinth alone. This is something that Paul was advocating in all the churches at all time. Turn back to chapter 1 for a moment. I want you to see who he's writing to. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1. And look at verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sothenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place. Is that you and me? All that in every place. Call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. It wasn't something that was local and temporary. Argument number one, Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 11 is trivial. Argument number two, Paul's teaching here is local and temporary. Argument number three, to get rid of this uncomfortable teaching is this. Paul's teaching here is cultural. This reflects the Greek culture in the Roman Empire at this time. It wasn't respectable for a lady, a woman, to have her head uncovered. But we live in a different culture, and the head covering doesn't have the same significance. That won't stick either. Because all the Greek and Roman ladies who went to the temples went with their heads uncovered, and they did not count it to be irreverent. And the Jewish community, as you know, the man always covers his head. And to this very day, a Jewish man will cover his head. And so the practice that Paul is commending here was contrary to the customs and culture of the day. Argument number four. It says that the woman's hair is her covering. Turn back to 1 Corinthians 11. Look at verse 15. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 15. But if a woman of long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. If the woman has hair, well then that's enough. But to make the woman's hair the covering makes nonsense of the rest of the chapter. Look at verse 4. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covereth, dishonoreth his head. The only way that I could preach this morning would be, to would be to be totally bald. Mind you, I was at the barber's this week, and they said to me, will you give me, will I give you a summer cut? I said, Dwyer, go ahead. Don't mind. But you see what I'm pointing out? The only way for a man to pray or prophecy is to be totally bald. You see, if it is proper for women to worship with their hair on their head covered, then it's improper for men to worship with hair. Look at verse 5. But if a woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, if the hair is the covering, if the woman be not covered, let her also be, be shorn. But if it's a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her, be, let her be covered. How could one shear her hair if she has no hair to begin with? The position is untenable. Argument number five, which says God looks on the, doesn't look on the externals, he looks on the heart. Well, there's a degree of merit in that argument. Outward appearance should always convey inward condition, but that's not always so. A Christian lady may have her head covered, but her heart may be cold. She may be indifferent to the things of God. She may be out of touch with God. Yes, God looks on the heart, but it would be very foolish to state that God takes no account of the believer's appearance when he's given us definite guidelines as to how we should appear in the services. Argument number six. The leadership in our church don't mind if we come with uncovered hair. Isn't it strange that there are few subjects that stir up the fire in Christians like this one? This may be the reason why the earlier part of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is taught far less than the rest of the chapter. Uh, likely, the apostle Paul got the tongue of some when he refers in verse 16 to the possibility of contention. Uh, as I have said, 
It was the custom of Jewish men in that day to appear in the synagogue with their heads covered. To this very day, they go to the western wall with their heads covered. It was the custom of the Greek women to enter into the temple with their heads uncovered. But Paul says, we have no such custom. If the women at Corinth appear uncovered, this is not our practice. Neither the churches of God. Was there a time in the history of Lurgan Baptist Church when the leadership did not believe in the head covering? Certainly for the last half century, this has been the position of the eldership and still is today. On their behalf, I want to thank the ladies on the assembly for respecting this and having your heads covered. But why? Why do we believe in the head covering? And I'm using that phrase deliberately and specifically, for undoubtedly Paul had a veil in mind here. Why? Well, let's look at the passage. It's all about headship. Pastor Judd, in his wonderful exposition of 1 Corinthians 11, entitled it in authority in the church. Authority in the church. And I want to look at headship in a threefold way. Look at the passage. One, headship is declared the doctrinal aspect. The doctrinal aspect. Paul would have these saints at Corinth know what he's about to declare. Jack Hunter in his wonderful commentary on 1 Corinthians 11 states, he now tackles a question of practice by reference to a theological principle, in this case, headship. Look at verse 3. The key word is head. I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. There's only one word for head in the Greek New Testament, but it's used in different ways. It's used in a physical way as part of the body. It's used in a spiritual way as a position of authority. You look at verse 3, it's used in a spiritual sense, but in verse 4, it's used in a physical sense. Paul says, here's God's order of authority. Here's the principle of headship. Here is headship declared. Look at verse 3. God is the head of Christ. Do you see it in verse 3? And the head of Christ is God. Does that imply inferiority? Never. The Lord Jesus is co-equal and co-eternal and co-creative with the Father. You remember the words of Philippians chapter 2, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Did not the Savior himself say, I and my Father are one? In what way then may we speak of God the Father being the head of Jesus Christ? It is clear that they are, es that they are equal in essence. The difference is in the area of function. You see, my dear friends, in carrying out the great plan of redemption, God's great plan of redemption, the Son was subject to the Father even though He was equal to the Father, He could say. I do always those things that please him. He could say, I have not spoken of myself. In the garden of Gethsemane, he prayed in agony, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Here is the beautiful relationship in which the Lord Jesus became a servant that he might save us. My friends, where would we be this morning? if Christ hadn't have humbled himself. Now, can anyone say that the pattern of relationship between God and Christ is a wrong one, it's a bad one? It's a pattern of what every man's relationship with Christ should be. God is the head of Christ. Look at verse 3 again. Christ is the head of man. In God's order of things, every man is to have the same relationship to Christ that Christ had to God. We men were supposed to allow the Savior to do in us what he wants to do. We're supposed to allow the Savior to work in us what he wants to work, what to say, where to go. We're to live under the lordship of Jesus Christ. 
Paul is saying to these believers in Corinth, you brothers in Corinth, you have someone who has authority over you, someone whom you must obey, someone to whom you must submit. This is God's pattern for us men living daily under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now men, how are you getting on? Are you fulfilling God's pattern for your life? You see, no man has the right to talk about his authority over the woman unless he's under the authority of Christ. We men are not fit to exercise authority unless we are under authority. And so God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Look at verse 3 again. Man is the head of woman. I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man. Now, does that mean that women are inferior? Of course not. There are many women who are far superior to men in a thousand different ways. There are a whole lot of you this morning who can do things about the house. I can't wear a plug. And so in many ways, Women are superior. Sometimes they're intellectually superior. Sometimes they are superior in their profession. There is no inessential, there is no essential inequality between the two. But in God's order of things, the woman is subject to the man in her role and function. You see, the same God who has revealed areas of equality, has also revealed areas of distinct responsibility. God has given the headship to man, but the world won't have it. And so we live today in the world of women's lib, and women parade their rights. In some Scandinavian countries, roles have been reversed, and husbands stay at home and look after the babies, and the women are the breadwinners. Why not, they say. We're in the same standing before God. Why not have equality in the home? Why not have equality in the church? For the same reason that the same God who has revealed areas of equality has also revealed areas of distinct responsibility. My friends, men and women are equal when it comes to grace. They are not equal when it comes to place. They are equal when it comes to acceptance with God. They are not equal when it comes to authority from God. For God has given the headship to man. So we see that headship is declared. Well, you say, how is this matter of headship demonstrated in the church? Well, look at verse 4. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. If a man comes to worship with a hat on his head... It dishonors, it disgraces, it puts to shame his head, Christ. Conversely, if a woman comes to worship with no veil on her head, she dishonors, she disgraces, she puts to shame her head, the man. Paul says in verse 5, if she does that, it's just as though her head were shaven. How many ladies have you seen lately with their hair shorn completely Bald, it's a shameful thing, isn't it? French women who befriended the Nazis during the war after the liberation of France were taken and they had their heads shaven. It's a shameful thing. Well, if it's a shameful thing not to have nature's covering, it's just as shameful not to have the covering that Paul is advocating here. Headship is declared. That's the doctrinal aspect. Come a little further. Headship has developed the creational aspect. And I want you to see that Paul is bringing before us here the divine order in creation. You see, this is no accident. Paul's not arguing, as some would have us believe, on the basis of marriage. Paul is arguing on the basis of creation. Therefore, he places the same responsibility on both the single and married women. Isn't it interesting that Paul accepts as factual and historic the account in Genesis of the creation of the man and the woman? 
with Paul. Theolo theology always governs practice. Creational order is the function of his teaching. Now notice how Paul develops this theme of headship. Let's go quickly. He talks about the origin of human society. Look at verse 8. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for, for, the, but the, woman for the man. We know that from Genesis 2, God made man first. And then God looked out and said, It isn't good that the man shall be alone. I'll make a help, one, one to complete him. And, and the rib which the Lord had taken from the man made he a woman, and he brought her unto the man. Now, I want you to get the order. God made man first, and then woman second. Now, I've said this is important, for Paul is arguing for the head covering on the grounds of creation. Man is the image and glory of God. Therefore, his head ought to be uncovered. The woman is the glory of the man. And therefore, in the worship, there's only room for the glory of God. The origin of human society. Look at verse 11. Notice the order in human society. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man and the Lord for as the woman is of the, of the man, even so the man also by the woman, but all things of God. You see, God has ordered it that men and women are truly interdependent. Did you know that there are four ways in which human beings come into the world? By creation, Adam alone. By formation, Eve alone. By generation, men and women alone. By incarnation, Christ alone. Now, there were many things that God could have done at creation, but he didn't do it. He could have created Eve first, but he didn't do it. He could have created Adam and Eve together, but he didn't do it. The woman is of the man. This is so because at creation, woman came from man. The man is also by the woman. This is so because in natural generation, man comes through a woman. You see, men and women need each other. They depend upon each other. Doesn't mean that we all get married. But it does mean that we cannot live socially without the opposite sex. We are partners, but God has given the headship to man. So think about the origin of human society. And then the order in human society... And then notice the onslaught on human society. Look at verse 3. For Satan has attacked the threefold relationship that's described in verse 3. You see, Satan has attacked Christ's submission to God. What, what were the temptations? Were they, not all were they not all attempts to undermine Christ's submission to God? And then Satan has attacked man's submission to Christ. And when this middle link is broken, it spells disaster. The tragedy is this, that men who no longer put themselves under the authority of Jesus Christ lack the authority to lead their women folk. You know the happiest home? I'll tell you the happiest homes. The best integrated homes are the homes where the man is the head of the home, freely acknowledged, and he exercises a leadership of love. You know what the devil loves to do? The women folk to take the lead. And sometimes they have to because men abdicate their responsibility and they don't live under the authority of Christ. And so Satan has attacked Christ's submission to God. Satan has attacked man's submission to Christ. But look at verse 3 again. Satan has attacked woman's submission to man. In the Garden of Eden, why did the devil go for Eve first? Come back to Genesis 3 for a moment. Just for a moment. Genesis 3. Look at verse 1. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. 
And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, my question this morning is simple. Why did Satan go to the woman first? Why? I'll tell you why. Because he was attacking God's order of things. He said to the woman, You decide to eat of the fruit of the tree and don't consult your husband and don't talk with your husband and don't commune with your husband. You just lead him along. It's the first instance of a hand-packed husband and it had disastrous results. And from that time the devil has been trying to smash God's pattern for society at every link of the chain. Do you know what happens, my dear friends, in a society where the Lord is in control? A society where God is in control is a society where the men are masculine and the women are feminine. But when God is forgotten, clothes and fashions go unisex. Men and women wear the same clothes. Men dress in effeminate blouses. They put rings in their ear and they carry handbags. And women dress in men's clothes and they get their heads cropped and there's no distinction between the sexes. And that's a deliberate defiance of God's order of things. Headship is declared. Headship is developed. Come back to 1 Corinthians 11. Hope you're still with me. Headship is declared, the doctrinal aspect. Headship is developed, the creational aspect. And then finally, headship is displayed, the practical aspect. How do we as Christian women outwardly express our submission when we gather for public worship? Well, Paul tells us here that this matter of headship is displayed in the church in a twofold way. One, a man will put his head covering off. Look at verse 4. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. His head, remember, is Christ. Now, what would you think this morning if I come into the pulpit with a hat on my head? I keep my head uncovered because Christ is my head, And I'm under his authority. It's an outward visible sign that we men are under Christ and that we accept his authority. A man will put his head covering off. Look at verse 5. A woman will put her head covering on. Verse 5. For every woman, or but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. Now remember. Her head is man. You see, just as a man uncovers his head to show that he's under the authority of Jesus Christ, a woman is to cover her head to show that she's under the authority of man in God's order of things. Now, ladies, I want you to see this morning why you cover your heads. This is not some ecclesiastical tradition as some would have us believe who want almost to rip 1 Corinthians 11 out of the Bible. This is a biblical truth. Headship is a biblical truth. And a Christian lady and a Christian girl will cover her head for at least a number of reasons. Look at verse 6. One, there's to be no deviation from the plan of God. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be covered, or, or, or if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Let her be covered. Ladies, this is God's order. Don't go with the crowd. Don't follow the leader. Know why you must wear a head covering in public worship. Grasp the principles of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And you see, it'll not matter whether you're in Lurgan or Port Rush. It'll not matter whether you're in Lurgan or Jerusalem. It'll not matter whether you're in your home church or a holiday church. It'll not matter whether you're in this building or a barn. Your covered head 
will be an outward sign and symbol that you accept God's place and God's order of things. Now, there are those who hold that while the sisters should be covered at the Lord's table, it's not necessary for other gatherings. It must be stated that your New Testament knows nothing of one gathering of saints being of a different order or rank from another. You see, the question this morning is not what we gather to do or when we gather or where we gather. The question is simply this, to whom do we gather? Surely if we're gathered unto his name, it'll not matter whether it's home or away. The barn or the building, these principles ought to apply. No deviation from the plan of God. Verse 7, very quickly. No competition in the presence of God. For a man indeed ought to cover his head for as much as the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. J. Boyd Nicholson reminds us that image is representation. Man represents God as his image, but glory is manifestation. And the glory of man must not be manifested in spiritual exercises, says Nicholson, and therefore that glory must be covered. Do you see why a Christian lady will always want to cover her head? To be uncovered is to expose the glory of man. And in the presence of God, there's only room for the glory of God. I was thinking this week about Rebecca. You remember when Rebecca was being brought to Isaac, a lovely picture of the church being brought to Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember she asked the servant, what man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant said, it's my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And when God's glory filled the temple in Isaiah 6, the very seraphim veiled their faces in the presence of God. Look at verse 15. But if a woman of long hair, it's a glory to her, yes, in daily life. A woman's hair draws attention, it draws admiration, but not in the presence of God. And there a Christian lady will veil her glory so as not to distract from his glory that no flesh should glory in his presence. Professor David Gooding says this, It goes without saying that the head covering best suited for this purpose would be more likely to resemble a mantilla. And Pastor Timothy Nelson reminds us that the word that is used in 1 Corinthians 11 speaks of an ample covering. And so, ladies, I challenge you this morning. What you're wearing, is it covering your glory or accentuating your glory? No deviation from the plan of God. No competition in the presence of God. Look at verse 10. Don't miss it. No insubordination is the people of God. For this reason, ought the woman to have power or a sign or symbol of authority in her head because of the, for the angels. Isn't that interesting? Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 that God is using the church here and now as an object lesson for angels both good and evil, to teach them something of his manifold wisdom. We never think of the angels, do we, when we come to worship. They're watching us, the angels. They're looking at her appearance. They're looking at a dress. And when a woman comes into a gathering for worship with her head covered, she becomes to the angels an object lesson of submission to divine headship. What a, what a rebuke she is to the wicked angels. You remember there was a time when the angelic forces rose up in rebellion against God. You remember that Lucifer was his name and he took one third of the angelic forces with him and they were cast out of heaven. Uh, There was rebellion against the headship of God, against the authority of God. And now what God is doing is this. He's showing his redeemed people to the angel. He's saying, I will show you in another company 
that I have redeemed by the blood of my son, another company who loved me, I will show you headship in action. What a wonder to the angel as they peer into the assembly of God's people and see a man with his head uncovered and a lady with her head covered, accepting God's order of things. No deviation from the plan of God. No competition in the presence of God. No insubordination as the people of God. Look at verse 15 again. No exasperation at the provision of God. If a woman of long hair, it's a glory to her. Her is given her for a covering. Nature doesn't all give to women a lovely head of long hair. It's a glory to her. But, oh, ladies, think of the provision of God. Think of the goodness of God. Think of the generosity of God. And giving to you, ladies, this glorious gift, long Beautiful hair. Now tell me, how have you responded to his goodness in the gathered company of the redeemed? We can only respond in one way, by showing off our glory or seeking his glory. Well, there you have it. You have to do something about it. You have to respond in some way or another to the Holy Spirit's teaching on headship or else you have to say, Dennis, what you were talking about this morning is utter nonsense. Let me close with this thought. We can hardly argue that as long as our hearts are right, we don't need external symbols. You could hardly argue that. For there are three symbols in the chapter. We're going to look at the other two next Sunday morning. There's the head. There's the bread. There's the wine. Are you telling me that one of these symbols is insignificant? Well, if so, which one? Will we do away with the bread next Sunday morning when we gather around the table? Will we dispense with the wine when we gather around the Lord's table? Then by what method of interpretation can we say that the other symbol is relegated to the growing list of inconsequentials that we hear about these days? A few women refused the Queen's request to wear a covering at Ascot or the palace. Isn't it interesting that the general consensus among the Muslims is that a Muslim woman is required to cover her head with only her face showing as part of the overall dress, code, and behavior that Islam prescribes. My friends, shall we show less respect for the declared wishes of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Will you gaze afresh on your Savior this morning? Look at him who took the form of a servant and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And the Savior was submissive to his head. I wonder, will you be to yours? Let's pray.